Uh, the day that the announcement was made, uh, I was announced as being Parliamentary Secretary for Faxia. Uh, Jenny wanted an opportunity to talk with both uh, Julie Collins and myself about areas of responsibility that she may give us, uh, but uh, I was uh, very, very pleased to be given the responsibility of disabilities and carers, a role that I have played uh, in opposition for three years. So to Mitch's comment about continuity and having to retrain another shadow minister or shadow or parliamentary secretary, uh, I, I've got to say I probably needed a bit of uh, uh, up, upskilling, but I have, I think, I've got, I think I had the basics from those three years of working in opposition. Okay. Uh, I'm honoured to have this position at a time, and I think I said it earlier today, at a time which I think uh, is very exciting. Uh, for, for people with disabilities in, uh, in Australia and for the sector. Uh, we've got a, a great piece of work in front of us. Uh, I also commend the s yourselves for the strong single voice message that you've been able to pull together uh, in having this discussion and I, com I commend you for that and encourage you to continue uh, in that vein. I hope that answers your question. Okay, I'm just going to take a question from Sam at the back, please. Uh, hi, Samantha Jenkinson. Um, I've this is to the politicians and to um, the Productivity Commission uh, commissioners. Um, I'm wanting to know, firstly, from uh, Jan and Mitch, uh, with the Australia's signatory to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, I guess um, many people would see that moving forward with the NDIS is simply a matter of um, living up to the obligation of that signatory. I'm wondering what your view is on that. And to the commissioners, um, will the final report be a much stronger link to the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities in terms of principles and values? Okay. Sorry. Pardon? Go and go. Okay, Mitch. Sure. I, I, I might uh, start on that. Um, I'm, um, I'm all for uh, conventions and protocols and. Uh, documents which uh, Australia signs up to which, uh, which affirm and articulate rights, uh, particularly for people with disabilities. Uh, but those sorts of documents and protocols um, don't mean anything uh, if you don't have uh, the money to give effect uh, to uh, decent support and if you don't have proper structures that can deliver that. So yes, I agree with you that uh, uh, a new, new national arrangement uh, would help Australia uh, meet those, those obligations. Um, but I think it's, it's always important to bear in mind um, with those sorts of international obligations and agreements that they're only as good uh, as the will of the government of the day uh, to commit to uh, proper resources. Thanks, Bruce. I'll be brief. I think the, um, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities and our responsibilities now that we are a signature uh, to that treaty is something uh, very significant. Uh, because along with being a signatory to the, committee, uh, to, to the Convention, we now have the obligation to report. And that's where I think the National Disability Strategy is an extraordinarily important document. It gives us the framework for reporting and then um, to allow a, a system as described by the Productivity Commission, underfunded, fragmented, uh, et cetera, uh, to, to stay in place, I think would be very hard <coughs> for uh, a country to say that we could fulfil our obligations. Uh, it's clear from the description of our disability service system in Australia that something has to happen. Uh, our government can't respond to the, to the draft report, of course. we will respond in time to the full report, um, but uh, those four words are as a description of our disability services system in Australia from the Productivity Commission cannot go, cannot go unanswered. Okay, look, I'm just going to take a question from the third row. And I'm just very conscious there are a couple of people, Val and George, you've got your hands up. We're going, we are going to try and take questions from people who haven't yet had a chance to ask them, okay? So I suggest you, if we get to the point where we People who haven't asked a question have asked them, we'll come back to you. So just from the third row, please. Okay, thank you. Is this working okay? Uh, no, no, you just... You just Sorry, then. Uh, hi, my name is Les Cope. Uh, I've just got a general comment and also a question to the, uh, the commissioner. The microphone, please. 
Bruce, while, uh, while Les, I think, is... Uh, uh, Les, just a second, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, there's a second part to Samantha's question. Question, yeah. Uh, and uh, we could shirk our responsibility, but might we just take the chance? <laughs> and that was, um, what it, was the commissioners going to make more, uh, give greater weight or focus on the UN Convention in our final report? Um, Sam, I, I refer you to Chapter 1. We do uh, cover the Convention uh, at some length. Uh, but uh, as you know, there are two considerations that temper the Convention. One is that a government can always refer to the resource constraint, and they also can also refer to progressive implementation rather than immediate realisation. So while we both see value in the Convention, I don't want to underplay it, uh, you have to say it's not a very uh, ironclad set of protections, and we consider that the best way forward is that people have certainty about their entitlements through a well-funded um, legislated approach, and that's uh, our position at the moment. Um, we look forward to reading submissions, and you may put one in on this, but I just wonder whether the UN Convention at the end of the day can be brought to bear if a government chooses to look at those uh, escape clauses. Okay, so the gentleman, please. Oh, hi, is it working now? Yes, it is. Uh, my name is Les Cope. I've just got a, a general comment and, and a question. Uh, I have read through part of the report, to be honest. I haven't read through all of it because it's quite a, a formidable document. Um, I remember reading some literature some months or so back which talked about the actual cost of the, of the uh, NDIS. And um, there's been a lot of discussion today about the $6 billion number. Now, the report that I actually read indicated that if in fact, parents with children with disability were actually able to leave when their children become leave uh, adolescents are becoming adults, young adults. If parents, in fact, were then able to go back into the workforce and, in fact, not actually be dependent on supporting their, their children, then that, in fact, would be an income that would actually come back into the community, uh, which would actually then, in effect, pay that six billion dollars. And I think the report that I read indicated that it would be even up to the extent of about twenty-five to twenty-five billion dollars that would actually come back into the into the community from the money of the parents that who would actually then be working. Uh, just to put some, some perspective, my wife has actually been supporting our son for the last, say, 15, 20 years or so, uh, since, he, uh, since he left, uh, <coughs> since, he, uh, left uh, since he became a young adult. Uh, and I, in fact, left uh, my teaching career about 10 years ago just to get additional support there. If we'd both, in fact, been working over that time, uh, I suspect we would have been making quite a big contribution that would well, well and truly uh, have counteracted this $6 billion figure that uh, is often talked about. I'm just wondering, has the commissioner, have the commissioners actually realised that, that account and has, is that being sort of uh, reflected in the document and the report back to the, uh, the government? John. Um, thanks, Les. Uh, many people have made this point to us that there are undoubtedly going to be economic offsets that, that to some extent will mitigate the, the total extra cost of, of the support. Um, one of the one of the things we have to contend with in putting this up to government is the, the technicalities of forward planning in the budget process. Um, and one of the rules of government is that second round effects is, is not part of the forward planning process. So while we can um, start to do some work on the offsets, and I have no doubt that they are considerable, that's not likely to influence the government's decision in a formal sense. It doesn't mean to say that these arguments aren't very legitimate arguments. It doesn't mean to say that tier two and wider community capacity is not a fundamental requirement um, to sit alongside the NDIS. Thanks, John. I'm just gonna take a question from the left and then I'm gonna go to the right where the microphone is and then I'm gonna come back to the left, okay? Just so everyone knows. Hi, Vanessa Blair from Urella. Um, I think we all agree that there needs to be a major reform and I just want to know what I can physically do when I go home tonight to start supporting you guys in making this change. Continue to do what you're doing now. Uh, talking openly, honestly about uh, what it will mean, uh, gathering the support in the community, uh, speaking with one voice, uh, making contact with your Member of Parliament, whether they be your House of Representative member or your Senator, uh, but continue the discussion. 
I think uh, we do have a chance for uh, you know, a, a broader community dis discussion about disability that, that is being offered us, not only around the funding arrangements, but, a, but a how, about the way we treat people with disability. Now, in the intervening period, since speaking with you, I've, I've been to a community forum uh, on the east side of Melbourne, uh, where, once again, people are talking about uh, bullying in schools and children with disability, and people are talking about things that I thought we dealt with 30 years ago when we had the International Year. Uh, so we do need uh, a big discussion about disability, how we fund it, but also how we include people with disability in our society in a much more generous way. Thanks, Jan. Um, question from over there on the right. You'll excuse me for not standing up. It's Joanna Nicol. I'm here on behalf of Ideas New South Wales, but I'm speaking as an individual. Um, I want to know what the Productivity Commission have been thinking in terms of means testing in entitlements or money that comes through. I have never had any government support for a wheelchair because either my parents or myself earn more than $60,000 a year. So while I was, while others I was growing up with were going out for drinks and whatever, I was saving for my wheelchair because $60,000 doesn't go a long way when you've got extra costs. So I'm just wondering whether, I suppose it's a, it's a word of caution. If you're going to use means testing, be incredibly generous if you also want to step alive. Um, thanks, Leslie. Um, th this, this can be a pretty short answer. Um, I think the Commission has made a fairly clear and strong recommendation that um, entitlements under the NDIS for reasonable support would not be means tested. Don't Thanks, John. Probably don't need to say anything more than that. I, I, I don't think so, John. I think it's very. I think it's unequivocal in the report. Um, I've just been asked to talk about why, and, and the, the why again is fairly pretty simple. Um, that the need for support um, and the ability and opportunity to participate fully in in the community um, is is we see as a, a fundamental human right. If I could just add, John, I think there is a comment in the report, and correct me if I'm wrong, that when people reach the age of 65, and therefore, uh, in terms of their age, are part of the aged care system, given that the aged care system is means tested, then this people would be means tested. But there's an expectation that people who've been in the system all their lives and hence have not had an opportunity to accumulate much would not be means tested out. It would only apply to people for example, who acquired a disability just before the age of 65. Is that correct? Okay. Thanks, John. Okay, question from the left, please. Lynn Straffy, I'm on um, Carers Australia Board and um, President of Carers Northern Territory, and I chair Darwin City Council's Disability Advisory Committee. I've got two questions. This morning, I think I heard that on May the 1st, there were some changes made to the Australian standards for building. So I'm wondering if our National Disability and Carers Insurance Scheme actually includes legislative changes that would make sure that those with disabilities had choices of where they could live. Because I can tell you in Darwin that there are, there's a building boom, lots and lots of flats are being made those apartment blocks have got parking on the ground floor, and then there's three stories of flats and their stairs. They simply do not have elevators in them. Now, this seems to me something that can be done almost immediately, but it is restricting the choices of those people with disabilities because they can't get appropriate housing, because the buildings simply don't exist. And I can tell you there's a lot of us in hotels now that are inappropriately inclusive with their accessibilities. So I'm hoping that this is an umbrella thing that will actually mean um, personal empowerment and choice on those sorts of public assets.